My name is Brian Malami. I'm age 37. Today's date is 9-16-16. And we are located in Greensboro, North Carolina, Central Library. And uh, I'm speaking with Chantel Wesley, my wife. And my name is Chantel Wesley Lamine. My age is 39 years old. Today is September 16, 2016. We're in Greensboro, North Carolina. And my relationship to my partner is I'm his wife. So, um, your war experience started at age 11. So take us back to the first day um, that you heard that war had hit your country. When was it and what were your thoughts about what you had heard? The first day I heard about the war in my country was December 24th, 1989. It was the day before Christmas. We were all excited about the next day because those were the few days in the year in my country that we were allowed to eat chicken. So we were really looking forward to that day. But the news reporter at 6 o'clock usually is when the news come on. And we heard the news about rebel has attacked my country of Liberia. And at that time, I wasn't really sure what a rebel is. You know, all I know was, hey, there's a war has started. So, but we didn't take anything seriously. You know, it, was, it seemed like, okay, this is happening probably way far in the countryside. Mm -hmm. And we, we never thought it would ever reach us. So, and my understanding of a rebel was very, I mean, I just didn't know until my parents came home and, you know, we explained to them what we had heard on the radio, or, I mean, right on the TV, and they said, well, rebels are people who just try to rebel against the government. And that's pretty much how we left it. And we didn't think much of it. Yeah. Okay. So between December through the time when the actual war hit your neighborhood, how many months went by? About six months I went back before the war actually hit us. But in between that time, you know, everything was going as normal. We, uh, we went to school. We, we did everything that kids would do, played outside, hang out with your friends. And it was just an exciting time because we just never expected a war to ever reach us. And did anything change about your neighborhood? Did you see anything differently? Did you hear anything differently or other accounts of people who had firsthand experience of the war? Yes, uh, during the midst of that six months, we have relatives that have fled areas that was, you know, that the war had reached. And they told a story of, you know, brutal atrocity by the rebel soldiers and the government troops alike. But, you know, we, we couldn't really imagine it at the time. Based on what they were saying, we just said, oh, you know, that's pretty terrible. But we really never got a full concept of what war can really be like. So we just continued to just, you know, have fun, and we were hopeful. And the government troop promised that, you know, they would protect us, and the president came on the air several times and tells us that, you know, everything is in control, the rebel is being pushed back, they're being handled. The news media and the newspaper, everybody told us that everything is okay, and we have nothing to worry about. And did you ever see the government troops going out to battle? Yes, um, oftentimes, we, especially in the evening after school, we'll go alongside the highway and we will see trucks full of military personnel in a full tactical gear. And, and we were just, I was so excited to watch them, you know, and we cheered them on to victory and we would sing, clap our hands, and we just enjoy watching them going to protect us. And who was the president at the time? The president at the time was uh, Samuel K. Doe. He, uh, he came into power about 10 years earlier. Uh, he was one of the first indigenous person to ever become president of Liberia. So it was kind of a big deal, but he was in power for 10 years before this date. So prior to him as a native-born Liberian coming into power, who had been in power in Liberia? Liberia was founded by free slaves from America. And, and their descendant, uh, which we call the American Liberians, they were in power for several years, hundreds of years before uh, Dole came into power. But they, when they came to Liberia, all the methods that they learned in America for slavery, they in turn enslaved their own people. So some of these reasons kind of didn't sit well with a lot of people. So Dole 
was the first native-born Liberian to overthrow. He overthrew the government and came into power. And when you say overthrew the government, what does that mean? He staged a coup d'etat in 1980, and he forced his way into power. Okay, and what was, and I know you were young, but just in listening to your parents, what was the general thought from your family about that happening, having a native-born Liberian being in power? I think it was a big deal for a lot of, you know, the native tribes. In, in Liberia, we have about 15 different tribes that is spread out in 15 counties. So it was a kind of a big deal because this is the first native-born descent to become president of this country. So it was a big deal. My parents are like, you know, they are both native born. So it was it was a big deal in our house. But as a kid, you know, I really didn't get into po politics. I didn't understand politics. So it was just all over my head. Okay. And then um, when you talk about your family structure, you said your mom and dad, how many other relatives lived in your household? Uh, at first, it was about eight of us in our immediate family. Um, but then... During the midst of the war, we family had came to stay with us. So at this point, we were about 22 people in the house, including adults and children. Okay. So let's skip forward. Um, so we talked about hearing about the war on December 24th, 1989. Now take me to the actual day. What is the day that the war hit your neighborhood, and what were you doing at the time? So set up the scene as to what you were doing. So it, it was the morning of July 2nd, 1990. You know, we, it was a school day, and uh, my mother, we, we all woke up, and somehow my mother told us that she just doesn't have a good feeling that day. So she told us to remain home and just to see how things going to blow out for the rest of the day. So we were excited. We said, yeah, you know, we get to stay home from school today. So we got up. Uh, we had breakfast, and we went under this tree. It was like one of our favorite trees. It's, it sat right next to the house. So we got up and we went and started playing, just like teenage boys would do, having a great time. We were playing, actually we were playing checkers that morning, I remember. And uh, we had made up checker boards, we made up seats, and uh, we were just having a good time having conversation between me and my brothers. Okay, so it's you and how many of your brothers are outside? Me and five of my brothers. Okay, and you're playing on this homemade checkerboard? Yes. Okay, and so then what happens? So... For me, I've always been the person with the very keen senses, and I listen to the surroundings. So as we playing, I heard a very loud explosion, kind of sounds of a thunder. And I paused, and my brother's like, what are you pausing for? What's going on? And I said, did you hear that? They said, yeah, we did, but it's probably thunder. Uh, this is in July, so I'm looking up. It's hot. The sky was clear. There was no sign of thunderstorm. So, you know, I brush it off, and I continue to play. And then a second explosion went off, and I said, did you hear that? They said, well, I think somebody's trying to start an old car. I said, I don't know. That doesn't sound much of like an old car to me. So they brushed me off again, and the next time I heard another third explosion. This time it sounded a little closer, but this time it's followed by a whistle, and then another explosion. And the ground started to shake. And instantly after that, we heard sporadic gunfire all over the neighborhood. It's finally like someone had just set up like thousands of firecrackers. And then gunshot is flying. We could hear, literally hear bullets zipping in our ears. Now, this is all new to me. I don't know what to do in the midst of this. So we're standing, me and my brothers, and we froze. Just don't know what to do. And then suddenly, you know, my father came out you know, with his head duck, and he screamed for us to get in the house. So we all ran in the house, and somehow he knew what to do, so he told us to all lay on the floor. And as we lay on the floor, the shooting continued to escalate, and there was bullet actually flying through the house, breaking the windows, breaking dishes in the kitchen, and all the adults kind of lay over the kids to try to protect them. And we actually laid there for quite a few hours, and the shooting just never ceased. It just kept going. And we were terrified. Because, I mean, this is all new. This is things that we see in the movie. Never they would actually thought that this is going to be happening. And I, to myself, I said, wow, you know, I can't believe this is here. This is happening. 
this is the war that, you know, that people have been telling us about. And never did we realize that in a thousand years that today will be that day. So we continued to lay. And then after a few hours of shooting, the shooting ceased. And we heard voices on the outside. And um, they were telling us to come out of the house. So at this moment, everyone in the house kind of panicked, thinking that, okay, they want you to get out because they want to blow up the house. So we got up, most of us still in our pajamas. Uh, we darted out of the house, and we all split in different directions. So I could literally see my father holding my little sister going left. I was confused. I went left, and some of my brothers went. It was everywhere. People was running. The entire neighborhood was in chaos. There were literally hundreds of people outside, just scattered. So... My instinct just told me to just follow any adult. So we followed. We ran. Um, we ran. I didn't know what direction we were supposed to run in, but I just followed the adults in front of us. So we ran about, I would say, about a mile. And then suddenly, we saw two soldiers on the highway. It was like a major highway that runs through my neighborhood. So we ran to that highway, and we saw two soldiers standing on the middle of the road. So this is now the first time that you see what you've been told about, the rebel soldiers. Yes, this is the first time because I have always imagined what a rebel would look like. Because based on the story that we were told by other people, you know, they were scary, they do this, they wear that. So, you know, I was always curious. But, you know, somehow I always knew that they would be the complete opposite of this government troop. So, and, and indeed, they were. They were pretty scary looking at first. They, um, they wore dirty, cocky clothes. They had a um, bandana on the forehead. They pretty much looked like they haven't bathed in a while. They had small artifacts all over their body. It was just a scary sight. And they pointed the gun directly at us and told us to halt and put our hands up. Okay, so this is your first encounter, and we'll talk about moving forward in the war, but throughout this encounter, which is going to last for four years, your war experience, talk about the other rebels that you had interacted with. What were their ages? What was their demeanor? How were they dressed? Just anything that you can give someone who's never seen a rebel soldier before. So the rebel soldiers, you know, they were, at the time, the best soldier was the child soldiers, because you know, I felt that maybe because they were easy to manipulate. So we had, uh, I've seen kids as young as eight years old um, as a soldier carrying the AK-47. Uh, but the, the, the whole appearance of the rebel was the scariest thing that you can imagine. I've seen, it was almost like living in a post-apocalyptic world. There were people wearing wedding dresses. There were carnivals in. There was uh, outlandish costumes wigs, uh, diapers, uh, some even stood in the nude. <clears throat> so it was a pretty scary sight to witness. And you talked about when you um, dispersed from the house that day that a lot of people were still dressed in their pajamas. You had just intended on staying at the house that day. Tell us about what was on your feet that day. Well, I had nothing on my feet. And I didn't realize that I was barefoot until several hours later when actually the pavement started to get hot and I started to step over debris like bullet shells, broken glasses from cars that were being shot at on the highway. That was the point that I realized that I was barefoot and I did not obtain anything on my feet for days after that point. So you talked a little bit about your parents. You said your mom went off to work that day. Your dad was at home. What did your parents do for a living? My, uh, my mother was a midwife. Uh, she worked at JFK Medical Center, which was the, the government-owned hospital, one of the best in Liberia. She was a midwife. And my father, he works for Voice of America. Uh, it's a satellite relay station owned by the United States government in Liberia. Okay. And so your father, tell us about um, some of the issues that your father had along the way after you were after you fled from your house? So after we fled from the house, you know, we came to the understanding that this war was a tribal war. 
And certain tribe carry a certain appearance. And my father, being a Muslim, he um, carried a certain appearance. Like, for example, you know, he always wore a large beard. And the, the opposing tribe of the rebels, they were mostly Muslim men. Um, even though my father was not from this tribe, but he also had the same appearance. So he was often a target uh, for the rebels to kill. They, there were several occasions where they attempted to kill him. Uh, one of them which I witnessed firsthand. My father was pulled from the line. Um, a rebel soldier had a gun in his face, and he actually pulled the trigger, and the gun jammed. He tried several times to dislodge the bullet, and my father actually had come to the sense that this is it. So he grabbed my hand, and he grabbed my little sister's hand. She was eight at the time. I was 11. And he said, well, you know, if this is what you're going to do, my children will not survive. So, you know, and my dad was begging for his life, and the soldier insisted that he was going to kill him. So after he succeeded in getting the bullet back to where he wanted it, he raised it back up again, put it in my father's face. And just in that time, another rebel soldier had been standing and witnessing the whole thing. He stepped in and grabbed the barrel of the rifle. And they had a little struggle. And the, his partner succeeded in theming him down and, and calming him down. But he was, very, he was very aggressive and just wanting to kill someone. And he, his partner calmed him down, and he walked away cursing. And he looked at my dad and said, I haven't forgot you. I will get you today. And he walked off, and he told him that he would be waiting for him ahead. How did it feel to watch someone attempt to murder your father? Well, you know, at the time, I felt so powerless. You know, here I am. I'm a child. You know, with all this, my world is falling apart. I don't know what to do. I have no strength. And it's like, you know, just a moment of emptiness. You know, I'm just like a floating dud, just sitting there watching. So um, after the war started and you guys fled from your house and now you're walking, where are you walking to? Well, at, at first, you know, the rebels told us that you just go and, you know, we were uprooted from our home. And we were told to just go in areas that they had already captured. So we had no idea where we were going at first. It was just just uh, thousands and thousands of people on this stretch of highway. No food, no water. Half of them is barefoot. Just heading into the unknown. We was like a, just like a herd of animals just having no place to go. Until, you know, it wasn't until two days later that my dad conveyed that we were going to go to his workplace. You know, being that it was a voice of America, it was an American soil on, on Liberian land. So he assumed that it could be a safe place for us. So he would decide that we would head there. And when you got to Voice of America, what happened? When we got to the um, entrance, you know, there was a rebel checkpoint. It, it was probably one of the most dramatic time of my life. Um, as we approached the, uh, the gate, we saw a group of rebels and it had a, a, a man with them. He was, his hands were tied behind his bike and they were actually singing around him. They had machetes. Uh, they, when they saw us, they kind of got really excited to put up a show for us. And uh, they scraped the machete on the, on, the, on, the, on the asphalt to create sparks. And, you know, we just continue to watch them, and they sing, and they sing for us. So they pass us, and then within a, a, maybe a minute or two, I heard, we heard a single gunshot. So, you know, everyone turns around, and when we look, we saw them actually butchering him. They were chopping him up, his limbs, with the uh, machete. And my father turned our head to continue to look forward. And as we got closer to the gate, you know, there was a checkpoint right to the VOA gate. And um, it seemed like there was a man being interrogated inside. So all of a sudden, we heard the door got kicked open. And uh, I witnessed a man being pushed out of the, the, the building. And he was completely naked. He had a pair of boots on, but other than that, he was completely naked. And, and I'm standing and watching, so, you know, to see now what's going to happen. So I felt... 
pretty embarrassed and humiliated for this man because he was begging them for the life for his for his life and um they push him across the street to a place where you know they can they can kill him and uh as we witness one of the soldiers took his rifle from his back and he shot him three times in the chest and the man stumbled backward. He didn't fell to the ground right away. He kind of took a couple of steps back. And he's hovering just out of it. And one of his friends, a fellow soldier said, you know, just go ahead and finish him off. You know, you know what to do. So the other soldier, as we watching, I'm probably about maybe 20 feet away from this whole thing. And he shot him in the head right in front of us. And I watched as this man fell to the ground, and I watched his his head open from the from the bullet. And this is at VOA, so you're going there to what you believe is a safe haven, but yes. yet you're witnessing probably some of the most horrific violence you had seen up to that point. Yes. Did you feel like you were going to be safe behind those gates? I thought so. You know, and at the time being that they were outside of the gate. Um, doing what they do, you know, I felt that once we cross that point, we would be safe. So, yes, I did feel we would be safe. Okay, so you get inside of um, VOA. Had you been there before? I came to VOA maybe five years prior to this whole, before the war started. Uh, my father had a son, father work day. So he, he did talk me in there, and it was just one of the most beautiful places that i ever seen. It was it was beautiful. It was um uh, it kind of reminds me of a small America at the time. So your reference points of America were what? You know, basically, you know, back then, you know, my reference of America was, you know, music videos, movies, magazines. You know, we thought America was the perfect place. You know, it was a, it was a perfect paradise. And every Liberian kid dreamed to come to America one day. So just going to his job, you know, they set it up just like they were here. They had a beautiful golf course. It had a beautiful resident area for the workers. It was just a nice, clean place. And so when you stepped inside that day, it was just as, just it was as just nice. Just as beautiful. When we finally got clear of the gate and we got in, it was just like the way I remember it. And I just felt quite a relief that, hey, you know, we inside these gates. I'm pretty sure we'll be safe. How many people were there once you got in and you got settled? Once we got in, there was, I would say, about thousands of people there. Mm -hmm. I, I, apparently, they also have fled before us, you know, have fled there for refuge as well. So there was thousands of people there. Um, the, the apartment that they opened up for us have, I would say, at least, uh, it was a small apartment. It had three bedrooms, but it had at least about 50 people in there already in the apartment, just laying all over the floor and just trying to find peace and rest. So these were other people that were displaced, not yes. necessarily employees. Yes, there were other people that were displaced as well. Um, who was there at the time? I know it was your mom with you at this point. At this time, you know, we had no idea where my mother is because, you know, like I said, she had went to work that morning. So we had no communication on where she was, if she was even alive. We didn't know. And how long were you at VOA before she would join you or find you there? It would be about two weeks later before she found us. Um, she had got words that, hey, most of the people from this neighborhood you know, they all head up this highway, and most of them probably end up at VOA. So maybe you should start looking there. And that's what she did, and she found us. So in Liberia um, then, was there a means of using a cell phone or some communication to get in touch with people to find out where they were? No, there was no such thing. Our life growing up, there's no such thing as a telephone. Now, in some instances, some higher people have phones, but... The everyday life, there's no communication. You know, we communicate by just, hey, you just show up. You know, if I need to see you, I would just show up. So it's kind of a, you know, it's part of life. You know, we always expect somebody will drop by. Um, you know, most of the time, you know, we, we don't have mails to mail somebody any letter. So it's, we do things by word of mouth. You know, if I see you, as I say, tell this person that I will be there next week. Hopefully you will get, you know, you will get the message. And usually it works. You know, we, we find ways of communication. Okay, so you yeah. stayed at VOA in total how long? We were at VOA for probably about three months. And what was VOA. life like there? Well, you know, in, in the beginning, life was, you know, 
was kind of okay, you know, at first. You know, we there was no food, so we but we managed to, you know, hustle here and there in the forest. Um, you know, but as time went by, more people, as the rebel continued to push towards, you know, the capital, more people started to come to VOA. So then the situation started to change. Food became even more scarce. Water became very scarce. And then the grounds that was once beautiful quickly started to change because people started, you know, building shelter any which way they can. So the entire golf course was covered with tents, uh, wooden shacks, you name it. It would just, it turns into a, a, a pure chaotic place to be. And what was your dad do, doing during that time? My dad actually uh, went ahead and reported back to work. Um, I'm not sure exactly what, you know, operation they were doing at the job, but somehow, you know, the, his employer, you know, asked them to go into work. So he would spend most of his time at his job site. Okay. And then um, there came a point where you're going to leave VOA. What were those circumstances? You know, when we, the more we get to live in VOA, we, we more we saw that, you know, it's not as secure as we thought it would be because the fence line actually doesn't cover the entire property. They had ways that you can get in through the forest. So, you know, but there was time where we started to feel, you know, that this might not be working out because one day, you know, to our surprise, to our really big surprise, we saw a truckload of rebel soldiers in the compound. And my first thing was, well, you know, this is American soil, so what are they doing here armed? And to our surprise, they told us that we need to get out. You need to get out now. And we said, well, where do we go? And they said, y'all just need to get out. So as people are taking the time to try to understand what's happening, they pulled guns and started shooting in the air and started beating people. Now, some people have family members that have went in the forest, you know, doing here and about, but it told us that wherever you're standing right now, you need to get out now. So, you know, this time we kind of learned from before, so we ran in the house and tried to gather what we can, you know, and gather whoever we could find, you know, and we just, once again, we're heading out again into the unknown. And where was your father during this time? My father was actually at work. So we were in the resident area, and he was actually at the job area. So we can't get to him because they told us where we are. We have to leave now. So here, you know, my dad is going to be messing now. You know, we're going to be separated from him. So we head out. As we head out of the compound, we actually saw rebels actually breaking into the apartment and grabbing what they can. So they started looting the place. And we saw a van that rolled back with um, military personnel in the back in the front of the van. And we saw my dad in the, in the, in the van with the rest of the, the employees. So the first thing, you know, that comes to our mind is, well, maybe they're going to go and kill him. So they were with rebel soldiers. They were with rebel soldiers, yes. Okay. Um, so you guys leave, and then where do you go next? So we exit the VOA, and once again, we got onto the highway, Moravia Kakaton Highway. Um, the first thing that came to my parents, I mean, to my mom was, okay, you know, the next largest city on this stretch of highway is called Kakata. Uh, it's in Mount Gibi County. So we said we will head there. It was about, I think, 18 miles away. So we said, well, we're going to head to that direction. And when you say head there, head there how? Walking by foot. Okay, so you finally reached there. And did you have relatives there? We, um, it was actually a two-day walk. But when we got to Kakata, we had um, my grandmother, you know, lived in Kakata. So we were going to head to her place. Okay. Um, so you go to Kakata to live with your grandmother. And um, tell us about what happens in Kakata. So, you know, I have visited Kakata uh, some years back. So things was kind of like just almost like I left it. You know, it was, um, it was a beautiful place. My grandma had two houses. Now, while we were living at VOA, we had, our family had grown uh, from neighbors that we used to live together back, you know, at my home. So some of these neighbors, we have flocked together as family. So um, I can't exactly tell you the amount of people that we had in our group, but it was probably almost 30-some people at this point. So, but we were all like family, so we decided we were going to stay together. My grandma, she was, you know, a loving woman. Um, 
she opened up her home, one of her smaller home, and it was a three bedroom house, real small house, and there was already people in the house, but you know we made it work. So all those people, we um, we were giving two room to share, and so we started life again over. And Kakatung had a, you know day to day challenges, but we were making it work. The entire city was was filled with rebel soldiers. And, you know, we, we started to live amongst them. As time passed, you know, they became, some of them became our friends. And it was kind of ironic that these were the same people that were trying to, you know, rip us apart. But now we are living amongst them. So we even became to bond with some of them. And even some of my friends from back, you know, in my neighborhood when we were growing up, some of them had joined them. And um, some of my own brothers thought about joining them as a way of protection. And, you know, some of my friends, my childhood friends, they came to see me, you know. They were all dressed up in, as a rebel. They had their weapons. And, you know, but I tried not to see them as rebels. You know, they were my childhood friends. And, you know, it was a exciting reunion, you know, and we just try to keep it as pure as we can. Now... Was it ever presented to you or asked you if you wanted to join? Yes, you know, the opportunity, you know, came, you know, especially for my childhood friends. They said, well, won't you come with us? You know, we are family. We'll be together. We'll be protected. And so we did. You know, I just didn't think it was something for me. You know, I was going to remain who I am, you know, to the best means possible. Okay. So you eventually leave Kakata. And then where are you going next? We left Kakata and we feel that, you know, maybe we should actually just leave the country. You know, it would be a better chance. So my father took off and uh, tried to gain more information about how we could do this. So he left for the Ivory Coast, uh, which is a country that borders Liberia. And after some time, you know, he sent for us and we end up leaving Ivory, uh, Liberia and we enter into the Ivory Coast. And when you say leave the country, leave the country to go where? What was he looking into? My father was originally from a country called Sierra Leone, which also a country that borders Liberia. And this was his home country. And he said, well, maybe we should try to head to his home country. But the only way that you can get there to actually go around several other neighboring countries like Ivory Coast and Guinea to get to where he wanted to go to. Okay, so was it feasible to travel direct, but it was the war that prevented you from traveling direct? Yeah, it was the war because, you know, rebels would not allow you to leave the territory unless, you know, you find, uh, unless on a certain route, you know, meaning that you can't head back to a certain direction because it won't allow you. So we had to actually go around the entire country of Liberia. Okay. You know, it wasn't feasible, but it was, it was the longest way possible. But it was the only way. And how were you traveling? We traveled mostly by cars. You know, we were cramped up in, in little cars and just on the road for days and traveling to all these different countries. And how did your dad manage to pay for that? My dad, um, he was very good with saving money. So he has stacked some of his money during the midst of all this. He actually hides his money in his underwear and his socks wherever he can, to, because if they see it, they will certainly take it from him. So it's kind of, you know, what helped us along the way. Or else we wouldn't have never made it out of Liberia. How was the travel conditions? Were the rebels trying to extort him oh, every, for money? Um, every um, couple of miles, there would be a checkpoint. They would search you. They would interrogate you. They would threaten to kill you. Uh, the roads was not paved. It was dust everywhere. The, every... There's places that we got to where we had to cross the river on a raft. So they would push the car into a wooden raft and cross the... I mean, it was, it was amazing that a wooden raft could actually carry the, the car weight. Um, but it was just a... It was treacherous road. It was, you know, it was hot. There was no water. And we would travel for hours and hours and hours with no food just to try to get to where we got to get to. What was the demeanor of... Um, the rebels? Did they think they were fighting a good cause, or what, what was their demeanor? The rebels, you know, they always tell us that we should call them freedom fighters. They told us that, you know, they come to free us, you know, 
And being a kid, I could not understand what the meaning of trying to free me. You know, I didn't think I was in bondage. But what I see is you trying to kill me and trying to kill my family. So if you come to free me, why take lives? So I could not understand, you know, their motive, but they felt that, you know, this is a corrupt government and they will do anything they can to take this corrupt government down to save the Liberian people. Okay. So over a four-year period, you traveled through how many countries? Over a four-year period, I traveled to four different countries. Okay. And was there ever a time when you came back home to Liberia? Yes. We actually, uh, you know, when we got into his home country, you know, things didn't work out the way that we had planned. So we decided maybe we can head back to our Liberia and try to see if we can start over because, you know, we had heard about this new um, forces called the Ecomog forces, um, which is um, a country, several African countries that works together under the umbrella of ECOWAS. And it was um, sanctioned by the United Nations. They were actually initially a peacekeeper, a peacekeeping mission to Liberia. But I heard that, we, we heard that they have pushed the rebels out of our neighborhood, out of our cities. So we thought, well, maybe we could actually go back home. And how long did you stay home before the war broke out again? We came back home, you know, not knowing anything about what my country had become. And we started over. You know, our house, when we got to our house, it was totally um, gutted. Everything, I mean, when I mean everything, was gone out of the house. Everything was gone. All our family, belonging, pictures, whatever it is, the house was completely empty. Our house was covered with forests. And um, we used our two hands. We built, we rebuilt, and we rebuilt some more. Uh, and we were able to move back into our home. And then, for a very short time, fighting started again. The rebels didn't, did not take the fact that, you know, the Ecomo had pushed them out and they decided we're going to re-attack and they re-attacked the city again. And once again, we were uprooted. After everything we had done to, to rebuild, we lost everything again for the second time. So over that four year period, you left your house, went back once, and then that would be the last time you the would be in your home country. My house. And your country. In my country. Yes. And how did that feel? It's, it tears you apart because, you know, this is the life that you know and this is your root. And because of the trauma that you experience, you purposely stay away from your country. And so eventually you would come to America some four years later. Yes. You guys got accepted into what program? So um, when we uh, made it, after the Second War had broke up, uh, we escaped Liberia again and uh, we went into a refugee camp in Sierra Leone called Waterloo. And while we was there, we learned about programs that help refugee resettle in America or in other countries, but most Liberians wanted to come to America. So, you know, my father, we went and we tried for this program and we got qualified. And I came to the United States as a refugee. Uh, we came in small groups. You know, the first group was, you know, me and my dad and my little sister. Uh, we came to the International Institute of Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, they were our sponsor. They took us in, and uh, we were grateful for that. Uh, my mother came several years later, and I still have my brother and his family still here, uh, still there in Liberia. But um, since the 9-11 happened, it kind of put a tight lid on, on the whole process. So it took several years, several, several years for him to make it. And many of your adopted brothers did not get to come. You and know, you lost some brothers. Yes, to I death. lost some brothers along the way. Um, but my adopted brother could not come because the program was only for parents and their biological kids. So adoptive family did not count. And they were ensured this by doing a DNA test to prove that, you know, they are in, indeed your children. So despite the circumstances, you end up in America. How does that feel to be somewhere that you had always dreamt about? but yet to have to leave a home that you had always known? You know, I, you know, when we were growing up as kids, you know, we had always dreamed about the United States. And I have always known I was going to come here, but not in that way, not in that circumstances, not to be forced to, you know. But, you know, at the time, I just felt that, you know, this is great because America would probably give me the safety that I wanted 
you know, away from war and, you know, so, you know, I was excited to come here, but at the same time, you know, just the people that you leave behind, you know, is that couldn't make it, you know, I felt, okay, why am I so special that I'm getting to be safe? And, but just the people that you leave behind, you always remember their faces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as a newcomer, as an American, um, looking at you as a newcomer, what would you want me to know about newcomers to this country? I think, you know, one thing, you know, with newcomers is that, you know, there's faces behind why we come. There's stories on why we come. We come for various reasons. But, you know, in my situation, I came to save my life. And America was that great hope that could give me that. So, you know, people are willing to do anything to